ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to today's GIT Park. I'm Susan Yu, a volunteer of GIT Park. First of all, please make sure that your cell phones have been turned off or switched to silent mode. These days, the weather is really hot. I heard from the news that the heat wave will hit Korea about the week. On Tuesday, I ran to Everland, which is famous amusement park in Korea. Thanks to the heat wave, there weren't many people, so it didn't make much time to wait for the lines. However, I had signs of dehydration. I hope that you don't get the symptoms, so watch out for the heat wave. Anyway, today the speaker is going to talk about internationalization of Korean higher education, the need for quality consultation. Thus, Korea became one of the world's largest economies. So, the, so the government tries to achieve high quality education. As Korea is not a famous or popular international student destination, the government implemented some policies and programs, so the rate of international students increased. But the quality part is also important. Therefore, the speaker will talk about the impact of Korea government policies and programs, as well as some recommendations on how to pursue quality consolidation. This talk will be given by Eva Maruwan from the Philippines. She is the public relations officer of the Organization of Philippine Scholars in South Korea. She has participated as a student representative in various international organization forums. Let's welcome her to the big hand. Okay, hello everyone. Hello. hello. You're still sleeping. Hello everyone. Hello. <laughs> Was it? Is it hot outside? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see me here? Yeah. <laughs> because I'm a little bit small, so you might not see me. But anyway, it's really nice to see everyone here this afternoon. So uh, today I will be presenting to you about internationalization of Korean higher education, the need for quality consolidation. Actually, as I was looking at my title again on the GIC posting, um, I realized that the title seemed quite a little bit too intimidating, isn't it? It seemed like we're in an academic conference. I'm sorry for that. Well, I hope this afternoon I will be able to share to you what I really want to impart in a simpler and a clearer way. But before I jump right in the meat of the presentation, please allow me to give you two notes. First, let me share to you my personal background as to why I had an interest in this topic. And second, I will be clarifying some terms. You'll be hearing a lot in this presentation. Okay, here we go. I came to Korea under a scholarship for my master's program in 2009. Ever since I came here, I came to know many Filipino students in different universities. And I've been an Anni and Luna to many of them. Well, we know that being away from home entails a lot of different stories, different kinds of stories. I came to know their struggles, their experiences, in their academic programs. Coincidentally, last year, 2011, I became the public relations officer of the Filipino organization, Filipino Students Organization. And I realized that this is a great opportunity to conduct a research, an exploratory research on student welfare in terms of internationalization that is happening in South Korea. What I'll be presenting to you today is a glimpse of what I found out while I, I was researching. At this point, please allow me to move on to my second slide note. Let me clarify some of the words you'll be hearing throughout the presentation. Internationalization of higher education. Such big, big words, right? But what does it mean? Let's break it down. When we say higher education, it's also called as tertiary or post-secondary education. It is the education you get beyond high school. So it means your college, university, post-studies, 
graduate studies, and stuff like that. And then, how about internationalization? Internationalization is the process in which you integrate international or global or intercultural dimension to the higher education. So um, this includes different kinds of strategies. So what we have here is student mobility. It means like recruiting international students to the higher education. Or program mobility, it can be dual. You know the dual programs that you can study in Korea, and at the same time, you know you can get a degree in the U.S. or some other places. And next is institutional mobility. It's, have you heard of Songdo Project? Songdo, Songdo Project in Incheon. Yeah. So it's like foreign universities would be coming to the host, to the home, home country. For instance, in Korea, there are some American universities who would be having, which would be having campuses, branch campuses in Korea. So that's one kind of institutional mobility. But what I will be focusing more today is the student mobility. When students move, from, for instance, from different country to Korea. Okay? Okay, I think we're on the same page now. So let's go to the presentation. Education. This is definitely a very important word in Korea, right? Let's see a glimpse of the educational profile in Korea. And I bet we are all familiar, familiar with the education fever that is happening in South Korea. Let me show you an overview of the impressive statistical growth of higher education participation in South Korea. In 1950s, there are only 11,000 Korean students who were enrolled in higher education. Then, it expanded rapidly in the 1990s, and now Korea boasts as having the highest tertiary participation rate among OECD members. However, this growth, this exponential growth in higher education participation is not without complication. Based from the IMD report on competitiveness of world university, the academic competence of Korean education was regarded comparatively low in terms of international standards. With this, there is a growing dissatisfaction and fierce competition among Koreans that resulted to brain drain. You know what brain drain is, right? Like, the students would be leaving the country to go study somewhere else. In fact, in 1991, there were only 53,000 Korean students who went abroad. But in 2008, it rose to 216,000 students who left the country to study abroad. So, aside from the brain drain, there's another issue here. Is a question Education. Um, another issue is the oversupply of graduates experiencing difficulty in securing employment. And not only that, there's an emerging problem of the declining Korean student population due to the low birth rate in Korea. In order to address these kinds of issues, there was a government-led internationalization. It became the core educational policy where human resource development became one of the primary concerns. Well, it's a little bit small, but let's, let's work on this. We can see here that it started from Kim Yong san Can you see it? Is it pretty small? So, started from Kim Yong Sun, and you can see how it was progressing until we can see it from Kim Yong Bak. So, we can see that the educational institution were, the nature of the educational institution were changing. So, the scope of the education, Ministry of Education kept on changing according to the national needs and goals. 
this move aims to improve quality and increase competitiveness of higher education and research in Korea. To address one of the main solutions is to have a policy-driven student mobility. Two major government projects were facilitating this. Study Korea project and Brain Korea 21. So what are these projects? I'll be explaining more about this later. Okay. So, Korean government pursued three major implementation strategies. First one is the active student recruitment. Second is the internationalization of curricula. And the third one is internationalization of research. So let's take a look at the first strategy, which is the active student recruitment. One obstacle is that Korea is not a popular study abroad destination. Um, thus, a policy-driven inbound, so students from abroad coming in, that's inbound, student mobility was initiated. The government reorganized the existing educational agency called National Institute for In International Education, or NIIDE, towards initiating more proactive student recruitment, international student recruitment. Through Study Korea project, scholarships for foreigners, for international students, were given in undergrad and graduate programs. Not only that, educational institutions, which are their universities or the colleges, they were able to obtain funding from the government so that they could participate in overseas educational fairs. And con consequently, Korea was able to capitalize on the tiny Hallyu or the Korean wave, particularly among the Asian neighbors. So a lot of us, maybe, maybe including me, we like K-pop or K-dramas in we come to Korea. We want to see maybe uh, some stars walking up to John or in Gwangju, <laughs> right? So, okay. As a result, we can see here that there is an undeniable dramatic growth in terms of inbound student mobility, international student mobility. If you go to a Korean university these days, it will not be a surprise to you to see international students walking around the campus or studying with Korean students. You can see here, from 2003, there were only 12,000 students, right? International students. And then every year, it rose until about 90,000 last year. And the goal of the Korean government is to have 200,000 international students by 2020. So we have another 10 years to wait for double the number. The second one, the second strategy, is the internationalization of curricula through English medium instruction policies, or EMI. So EMI, English medium instruction policy, what is this? This is a shift towards an English-based curriculum, and a lot of non-English speaking countries have been adopting this kind of policy. Okay. There are three rationals. In Korea, there are three rationals to the shift. English would prepare students to be internationally competitive in the future labor market. Second one, EMI, for the English medium instruction, could attract more international students in Korea. Third, Korean academics could eventually participate more in the globalized academic world. There are various government led initiatives to incorporate EMI, the English medium instruction, in the universities. Under the, the Korea, Study Korea project, government, Korean government offered funding for educational institutions with EMI programs. For example, one significant EMI program was the establishment of GSIS. GSI, what does GSIS mean? Graduate School of International Studies. Honestly, I'm part of GSIS. 
That's my department, GSIS. So GSIS, what's quite unique about this GSIS program is that everything, all courses are taught in English. And in this program, when the government gave the support to these institutions, there were nine universities who were allotted funding. And the funding also goes as scholarship to international students so that they can get in the program. So that's the second one. The third one, the third internationalization strategy, is the internationalization of research. Korea's global educational competitiveness was regarded as low, as I mentioned a while ago. But even Seoul National University, Seoul Day, was not listed in the world's top 100 university before 2005. Korea had a non-competitive environment, which is professors had um, more relaxed research obligation, leading to low academic productivity. Moreover, there was a strong, there's a strong hierarchy in the academe where age and seniority is given importance rather than the merits. However, there was a shift to knowledge-based economy, right, in Korea. And this made the government prioritize the initiatives in boosting research and having publishing journals internationally. Okay. So there's a program called Brain Korea 21. Through this program, foreign researchers, foreign researchers, foreign students, international students are invited to Korean universities so that they would help improve their research productivity. So in here we can see the Brain Korea 21. So, um, see here, there's like two phases of it. It started in 1999 to 2005 for seven years. And then next is 2006 to 2012, so it's still ongoing. This is the last year, this year. So we can see there's a huge budget for this. It will not be reading that. And this is the sample of the scholarship details. So master's students, PhD, postdoc, they would be receiving different kinds of um, stipend, scholarship. And then we can see that there are participating centers and teams, 564 during the first phase and 568 during the second phase. And you can see that there are a lot of benefactors in this kind of program. Um, so what has BK21 brought forth for Korea? There are two significant contributions in their research culture in Korea. One, it pushed for increased research manpower. So all these foreigners would be helping out in increasing the productivity, right? And then the second one is the evident increase in research productivity. Okay, we can see. We can see that Korea's scientific index, which is like the journal, international journal, stuff like that, you can see that it has been increasing. So before Korea, Great Korea 21, until the second phase we can see an increase. And then the SCI ranking was also going up until 12. So I've shown you three strategies already. First is the active recruitment. Second is the internationalization of curricula, so having English classes in Korean universities. Third one is the internationalization of research which is getting in, um, inviting foreign, foreign researchers and scientists and students in the program so that they would be helping out in your research productivity. So um, I'll be showing you a little bit of summer, summary about that. So, study career project. So we can see like in 2001, 11,000 students. It grows to 89,000 in 2011. Brain Korea project, the scientific index moved up from 18 in 1998, it moved to 12 in 2007. Internationalization of curricula 3 and 9, you can see that there were an increased English courses as compared before. However, this emphasis
emphasis on rapid quantitative expansion resulted to compromised quality and challenging learning environments. In fact, NESD, the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology, has affirmed this. There were a series of investigations conducted last year, and certain edu educational institutions are now banned or ordered to improve their policy concerning international students. So they conducted a research on 347 universities, universities and colleges nationwide in Korea. And there, there are 11 substandard institutions banned from admitting foreign students in 2011, uh, 2012 this year because of some not good policies that they have within the, the universities. And 19 were ordered to improve policies and management of international students. As available researches of internationalization focus more on the quantitative aspects of internationalization, for the next few slides that you'll be seeing, I would like to briefly address impacts of rapid quantitative expansion. Okay. Let's go to the first one, the first impact. First, as research productivity demand increases, teaching and learning environment is being compromised. And this is affecting the nature of academic work ethics. Moreover, unawareness and unpreparedness to cultural differences among professors and students can bring forth cultural intolerance brought about by clash of culture. So, we know that the professors in the laboratories, they need to have more increased research productivity, right? And they need to publish in international journals. But it would be really, really hard to abruptly move up. That's why the foreign, foreign students and foreign researchers would be of great help. What is focused, focused now is just how the number grows up, like how the ranking from 18, was well, it 18? Sorry, I didn't memorize it. Rose up, rose up the ranking, right? But what we're trying to grasp right now is what is happening within the laboratories, not just the numbers. What is happening within the dynamics of the laboratories? This is the point that we want to point out, that we want to discuss. So we can see that because of this demand, there's compromised academic work ethics. It means long work in the laboratory. It means you know, a lot of negotiating between the students and the professors. I guess in Korea, the, um, the hierarchy of professor and students, it's, it's understandable, right? Like something mean and student and <laughs> But of course, that's we respect that. This is, this is Korean academic culture. But if you invite international students in, it would be a little bit different dynamics. We, of course, we're in Korea, we have to uh, respect the culture, but it's inevitable, I guess, that there would be misunderstanding or negotiation happening within the laboratories. So, what I am pointing at this slide is that if we only focus on the results, on the numerical results, and the number, oh, really, really good, it increased. But we don't focus on, we don't discuss what's happening within the laboratories or within the classes that this internationalization programs have been happening. We are not grasping another part of reality. Okay, let's go to the second one. Second, with the abrupt shift of EMI, you know, like it shifted from before all Korean courses and now suddenly you have English courses to take in, to, to 
to graduate, you can you need to uh, go to English classes so that you could be credited into your program. Um, with this abrupt shift, rhetorical EMI occurs. What does it mean? There becomes a problem when infrastructures, for example, the classes, the, um, the registration, the websites, or the participants, the professors, students, staff, are not yet ready for the English program. An over-promise and under-deliver situation could happen. For instance, have you ever been in a class when you were trying to register, it says they are English classes, English class, for example, la la la, la it's supposed to be in English. And then you get in the class, and then it turned out that it, uh, only the PowerPoint or uh, only the reading materials would be in English. But then the discussion, everything else would be in Korean. So this is one kind of rhetorical EMI. It's supposed to be EMI, it's supposed to be English, but because of you know a lot of circumstances, it doesn't become English at all. So this is what we call over-promise and under-deliver. So lastly, let's go to the mass impact. Although more and more international students are coming in Korea each year, there is an inadequate student support infrastructure, such as information dissemination system, or to some students, problematic scholarship management occurs. Actually, um, I will not be dealing a lot about this because it's a it's quite sensitive issue, and I think I need more time to deal with this with this stuff. But what I was saying is that because we focus so much on getting more students, just more students, more students coming in, but we're not ready to handle them, then it becomes a problem. These impacts imply that Korea has to go beyond quantitative outcomes but it has to gear towards quality consolidation. It has to focus on enhancing teaching, learning, and research process by strengthening academic and social cultural rationals in the policy development. For instance, when we increase the number of international students, it is not just their physical presence that should be taken into account, but it's not just about the growing statistics. But their presence brings along with them their culture, their identity. For instance, me, if I come to Korea, I'm not just a student, but I'm a Filipino student. I bring my culture. I bring my knowledge from, from home or somewhere, somewhere else. Okay? So maybe we have friends here from Indonesia or from, from other countries as well. So when we are in, in one class, it is also part of the dynamics. Not just in the class, but also in the dorms, but also in the school hallways, how we behave, how we talk. International students coming in Korea would have a huge impact in the academic environment. Okay. So, as we can, as I keep on saying, quality consolidation, quality consolidation. Let's not just focus on numbers focus on the quality. What does it mean? Okay. How can we do it? Um, I'll be presenting you three recommendations. First is benchmarking and creation of baseline standards. What does it mean? We know that in terms of internationalization, some universities are doing well. I'm not saying that every not, that all schools are not, not are having some problems regarding this issue. Some are doing well some are lagging behind. As a matter of fact, as we can see a while ago, the NESC investigation of all university is a good start. It's a good start of benchmarking. But I hope it doesn't just stop there. It doesn't just stop as naming and shaming. Oh, this university is not doing well. This university is, is doing well. It, I hope it doesn't just stop there. The government could create a baseline standards regarding internationalization, which, which becomes a reference to institution pursuing internationalization. 
Also, what we can do is have the sharing of best practices among institutions. For instance, Institution A has been doing, for instance, um, I'll share to you one, uh, one concrete idea. In some laboratories in, in Korea, um, I've heard of different uh, cases that they were working in the laboratory. Usually science laboratory, they're under funding, right, under projects. But then, all of a sudden, they don't have enough funding anymore. But the laboratory has invited foreign students under scholarship. But in this case, how can you give the scholarship to students if there's no funding in the, in, in, in the project? So should, should it stop? Should you just let them go home? Sorry, there's no money anymore. <laughs> but you can have to do that, right? Like, they already packed their bags and left home, and, and there's a promise to be a PhD or, or a master's student after certain, certain years. But these things are happening. There are some students who pack their bags, you know, and, or would just find work so that they can sustain their, their program. But there are good universities that has revolving funds. So uh, even if there's project, I mean, the professor tries to have this revolving fund. So if there's a project, some of the money he keeps. So that even if there's no project, there's still money going around. So this is called revolving revolving fund. But not all universities, not all departments would have this. Okay? Some would have, some don't have. But if we, we have this sharing of best practices among laboratories or among departments, then universities which you know are quite having a hard time would be learning from some other institutions who are doing well. Okay. Okay, the second one is strengthening student support system or establishing a centralized monitoring agency of student welfare. This goes beyond information dissemination. It's not just you know saying what activities students would have and stuff like that, but it can also deal with monitoring and assessment of the internationalization process. This mechanism could capture micro-level practices often overlooked, such as the problematic scholarship management. I'll be sharing to you um, another case from from our student. Um, about scholarship. Uh, when they came to Korea, uh, it was supposed to be all English program. That was that was the program, English all English program. So, but after they after one semester, they realized that it's not an all English program. It's, it's gonna be like uh, have your way, <laughs> find your way around uh, the program. So they can choose English courses in another department which is not part of their curriculum. And then, aside from that, they thought that the scholarship is just, if, if you say full scholarship means it's by merits, right? You get your money, and then you get the scholarship, the stipend, and then you study, right? But it turned out that they have to work as English assistants for a certain number of hours. So if they don't work, they don't get the money. But in this case, this is a bit different kind of case. If you say scholarship, it should be very clear that it's by merits, okay? Because you're good, that's why you're getting scholarship. But if you have to work and get your scholarship money, it's also it's called assistantship, teaching assistantship. It's it's not scholarship unless it is very clear from the start that you know we're going to give you scholarship, but this is what you have to do. It's a scholarship obligation. But if it's not clear, then there's a problem in there. So that's why this kind of um, say that. this kind of agency, support system agency, is very important. For instance, if a student had a problem, where where should you go? To the office, but it's the office who's having the problem. So where should you go? <laughs> go go to your friend and cry <laughs> or go home. But if we have an institution, which is, well, there's an existing agency already, NIIED, 
but NIIED is more just into recruitment, not into the student welfare. But what we can push is make NIIED, the government agency, to be also concerned with student welfare. It, could, it, it can act as a grievance committee, grievance committee or a tribunal if there's some other problems, serious problems. Of course, the small problems you can deal with it in the local area, but if it's, if it's a serious case, like scholarships or um, intellectual property right violations and stuff like that, where should you go? And then the last one is strengthening linkages and having constant dialogue among stakeholders. I believe in coming up with better policies. Effective policies are not merely devised from the top. It's not just the government, always the government doing you know, the policy and put it from top to down. But it is inviting the stakeholders, the university, the international students. There are a lot of international student bodies right now. For instance, our organization, Filipino Student Organization, or PISA, there's Korea International Student Support Association, or some other NGOs working for international students. Because if we gather together and share our thoughts, then we can find the pieces together. And not just, you know, looking at it from afar and, okay, yeah, let's just wait what's happening there. But if we come together and have a constant dialogue, then new ideas, fresher approaches could come up. Its challenge is to shift from mere quantitative expansion to quality consolidation. Critical reflection must be carried out on how internationalization should be pursued. With the results of the MESC investigation, it is an opportunity for us to re-examine the present approach and seek towards a more sustainable and internalized internationalization that could be a platform for reform that benefits not only the international students, but also the Korean students, okay? So if you're dealing about the micro practices, for instance, what I've said a while ago, like how the researchers are being done in the laboratories, the laboratories, it's not just about international students, you know, complaining, but it's also for us to reflect, why are they complaining? Sometimes, for instance, for Korean students, it's, it's always like that, so, um, you always hear it from your sombe that okay, laboratory would be over at two o'clock. <laughs> you already know that, so <laughs> you're 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 prepared. You're prepared before you go to the laboratory that this is the culture. But for instance, for international students, you don't know <laughs> it's it's the kind of uh, culture, academic culture. But sometimes, if we if there's an outsider point of view looking in the program looking in the processes. I think it would be a healthy dialogue among Koreans and international students to think the system, think about the system. It's not just about, well, culture is fluid. It can change for the better. It can change for the bad, but it can change also for the better. So I hope that as we have this reflection, critical reflection about what's happening in our universities, we could come up with better solutions or better how to say that? Better, better atmosphere for students. Not only for students, but also for professors and staff. And and in achieving this, what we need is transparency and accountability among stakeholders. I might, you might be hearing a little bit negative stuff what I've said a while ago, but I promise, I promise you that I'm very, very hopeful for the internationalization of South Korea, that it could go way, way, way better every year, as long as we cooperate, as long as there's gonna be a constant dialogue. Why am I very hopeful for South Korea? For me, there are three valuable keys in South Korea. 
particularly in the South Korean government and the educational institutions here. First, there's a strong top-down approach. If the government works, if the government creates better policies, it goes down well. Second one, there's a deep commitment of internationalization. We can see a lot of universities right now, you know, very active, very active in creating programs for international students and for Koreans. I think that's very good. It's a very good start. And the third one is responsive crisis intervention. If there's a problem, I mean, we know the pali pali, pali pali culture of Korea. If there's a problem, pali pali fix, right? Pali pali fix. And I think that's, in a sense, that's a good, that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. So I, I believe that these are very progressive disposition. And I believe if we keep on, if we keep on cooperating, and we keep on reflecting on what we're doing, we could achieve the competitiveness that Korea is searching for, is seeking for. So, um, yeah, that's about my, yeah, my, my discussion. I think it's a bit heavy, but uh, hopefully uh, you understood my presentation. So is there any other uh, questions and Shoes. Okay, so now we're going to begin the question and answer portion of the talk. If you didn't get a piece of paper when you walked in, uh, you can raise your hands and one of our volunteers will give you a piece of paper. Thank you. And uh, one final note before we begin. Uh, please do not raise your hand to ask a question directly. We prefer you uh, provide a written format. That way I can read it. Uh, so, okay, with that, uh, the way we'll begin. Uh, first question, which programs are most popular or which majors are most popular for foreign students? Um, it depends on, uh, wait a minute. Oh, I have my bag there. Um, can I answer that later? I'll be showing you statistics. It's not, I, I haven't memorized it, but um, there, the Study Korea program is for everyone else, but for the Korea VK21, it's mainly focused on the sciences. So there's a different, how do you say that, focus on the scholarships that students are getting. And later I'll be showing you the division of you know, how many students in which particular. Okay. And which program or major? does Korea sort of excel at? Is there any one program that they're really good at? Mm -hmm. IT, IT and okay. environmental engineering. Mm -hmm. Usually, uh, our Filipino students, even if their major is different back in, back home, for instance, they're in biology or something else, when they, they're coming in Korea, they'll be under the environmental engineering because Korea is pushing for green, green growth and green infrastructure and stuff like that, green economy. So it's, it's actually a win-win a situation. It's good for Korea because you have the researchers working for you. At the same time, if, they, if these foreigners go back to their countries, it's a good resource for them to, to give part to their countries. Okay. Uh, which majors or programs, if any, are the easiest or most difficult to teach in English? Do you know? Uh, I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I don't have uh... Okay. I, I can answer it later. Okay, okay sure. Thank you. Um, these changes, have they put any pressure on the cost of tuition for students in general? Uh, for example, in my native California, the universities have been getting less money from the state, so they've been trying to get more international students to come into the university system there because international students pay more money, generally. They pay higher tuition fees. Have you seen anything like that? Actually, um, that's very interesting. Um, the reason why there was an internationalization has different kinds of reasons. And one reason was the decline in student population. So, but particularly um, in different, how do you say that, non-Seoul regions. Usually, a lot of people would want to go to Seoul. So in other 
uh, regions, there would be Latino students. That's why the government actually um, helped institutions to go to overseas uh, educational fairs to invite more students coming in. And um, hopefully I can get my, I, I have my thesis. <laughs> but there's also a breakdown of how many students are paying. And international students are not all scholarship students. There are different kinds of international students. Some are paying, some are under scholarship, some are from the government, and, and stuff like that. But majority are actually paying, paying students. And 60 or 70 percent are from China. It's actually an interesting, um, how do you say that, interesting dynamics. Because in China, we know it's a huge country, right? And there's a lot of competition, getting in university. In Korea, you need students. You, you need students coming in because of the brain drain. Students are going out, and students are going to Seoul, or you know, or there's an imbalance of students. So it's a win-win situation. If international students coming in, it can be um, an income generation for universities. At the same time, it can increase the productivity of of research, and you know, the English classes would be. Uh, has have there been any uh, points of pressure put on Korean students, or have any Korean students sort of rallied in opposition to this in any way? Um, my answer would not be directly huh. there, but it's connected to that. As I mentioned a while ago, the NESC had the investigation last year, 2011, right? It was it, it happened because of the Korean students demonstrating because of the high tuition, of the tuition hike. So the NESD, the Ministry of Education, started an investigation among universities. And they found out that some universities were having creative accounting. Yeah, creative accounting. <laughs> and other, other things that they've been, using, they've been dealing with. And then while they were investigating about this, they also touched upon international students. They realized international students became cash cows. A lot of students just get in the university, you know, and then they started to drop out or just work, stuff like that. So um, it was a chain of investigation. So because of the first investigation, they found the creative accounting, the, that's why the tuition, tuition fees increase and stuff like that. And then there was another investigation for international students, and then the uh, NESC came up with name and shame. They came up with names of universities, you know, like these are the universities that were doing something else. <laughs> and, and now they're trying to have a reform. Too. They're trying to have a policy reform. But of course it's not yet here. But because of these things happening around Korea, they're pushing for more investigation regarding the tuition and the internationalization. Has there been any organized opposition from the professors, the old tenured professors, the ones who are who have a lot of seniority? Have they been opposing this at all? Opposing the internationalization? None that I uh, I've heard of. <coughs> but I guess it would be so much pressure for them. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Because before, as I, I've told you, um, the research obligations were quite relaxed. But then, because we need to internationalize. You have to write journals in English. <laughs> you have to write, write journals in English. And actually, for my university, um, I think my, my university, the Korean university, starting 2005, if you're going to be a professor in Koryode, you need to teach English courses so that you will be hired. So that's a, that becomes a, how do you say that? That becomes a qualification. Well, at least for the new ones, they already have that kind of setup. But for the old ones, they will be pressured to, uh, you know, do something else, or I don't know, to, to find their own way to cope up with the new policies. Uh, have you noticed if any of this push to internationalize higher education has been more supported by public or private universities? Has there been a distinction, or is it pretty much I think the very interesting in Korea 
is that it has a strong top-down approach. Even if you're a private university, you're getting funding from the government. So if the government, um, if the government says something, it trickles down. So I believe they have a fair share. I guess I'm 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 not very particular about this, but based on this logic, because of the strong top-down approach of internationalization, that the, uh, the the process was coming from the, the government trickling down. Then I believe. Have you heard of any uh, public opinion about this, this change? Public opinion? Yeah, like the Korean people. Has there been a poll, you know, that is... Uh, I haven't heard of it as of now. But okay. actually, um, March, last March 6th, was it last March 6th, there was uh, a dialogue uh, in the National Assembly among uh, Ministry of Education and some other professors dealing with internationalization and students. Um, actually, that was what, what she said a while ago, that I was part of the Open Forum, Open Forum on Policy Development on International Students. So I think that's what, and, and then it's uh, open to everyone. And we, we've seen Korean students there as well. But other than that, I haven't heard of Anything. But it's a good start. Okay. It's a good start for discussion. Uh, do you know the success rate or the completion rate for foreign students who attempt these programs? Uh, I don't have the, the statistics, but that's what we were pushing. Uh, what we were pushing uh, to have a research on, because most of the researches right now regarding internationalization is about results, about the quantitative results, like how the, S, the, the scientific index grows from this to this. How, it's kind of like more of achievement, right? But drop, drop out or rate, whatever, I think it's still a new thing. But probably the government has been working on it. Right. Right. So let's cross our fingers and wait for that. Okay. Uh, now we have some questions that are a little bit closer to you and to your program. Mm -hmm. uh, what does a student need in order to qualify for your program, a program like yours? Um, yeah, GSIS, I think uh, it was. GSIS. Yeah. Um, it's very typical, uh, typical application. Um, but of course, English uh, proficiency is the most important. The most important. So, in my department, um, if you go there, even Koreans speak in English. Everyone speaks in English. Honestly, as a foreigner. I've been trying to learn Korean a little bit by watching Korean drama <laughs> and Korean songs. So sometimes I try my Korean. I'm so excited to try my Korean. But then, because my Korean is so poor and I speak so slow, even my Korean does me, just speak English, it's okay. Just like, yeah. real. <laughs> um, Anyway, that's a general feel of my department. It's, it's, it's very internationalized. A lot of Korean students have been abroad, coming in, or, you know, um, and stuff like that. Um, it's a very typical application. And if you want a scholarship, you just indicate there. For the first, you know, admission, admission you just indicate that you need the scholarship. And then, how does the scholarship go? For me, my scholarship is POSCO. POSCO Asia Fellow, Fellowship, it's a private university, a private Scholarship, so I have my scholarship for the entire time. So I, I don't need to actually think about it. Uh, well, I have to study hard <laughs> to maintain a grade, but generally you'll be completing the program under that scholarship. But for other international students, for my friends, we have like 100% scholarship, 50% scholarship. So it depends on your grade in that semester. So that's why um, one of the problems. Uh, one of the issues actually in my department was that some students were taking really, really easy courses. Courses that they don't really need. <laughs> because they're fighting for the scholarship. Because you need the grade. <laughs> so so some, some students were you know, actually uh, complaining as well. Oh, they're taking an easy one, I'm taking a hard one. <laughs> I don't have any choice and stuff like that. So that's the general feel of, 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 at least in my department, the GSIS department, KU GSIS department. So there's this ranking 
the ranking is very important for scholarship. Why specifically did you choose to study in Korea? In Korea? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Why Korea? Why not? <laughs> Why not Korea? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, actually, I studied in Japan for exchange program. And interestingly, in Japan, I had a lot of Korean friends. <laughs> so even in Japan, we were like eating Korean food. <laughs> and then I went back home. Interestingly, that was 2006, I came back home 2007. Korean, the Korean um, exchange, you know, the people, people exchange started to boom. Because of maybe K-pop, K-pop, Korean dramas, uh, Winter Sonata, <laughs> Stairway to Heaven, <laughs> stuff like that. And, um, and, and Koreans were started to, started to uh, learn English in, in, in Philippines. So that, that was the start, 2007. I mean, that was you know, increasing. Before, even in my university, there was no Korean Filipino organization when, before I left to Japan. After one year, when I came back, there was already a Korean Filipino organization. <laughs> and I joined that. Um, I joined that because I was walking and saying, oh, there's a Korean, Korean uh, organization. It'll be fun. <laughs> so I joined that. And then in that organization, I met friends, Korean friends. And they were the ones who told me, why not study Korea? Yeah, why not? <laughs> that was a good suggestion. And they gave me um, tips, which universities are good. That's why I came to know Sky, Sky, and in Philippines, you don't have Sky. <laughs> um, but, and, and stuff like that, and other stuff about Korea. And, uh, and I gave it a try. That's why I'm, I'm here. And I'm really happy because I love Korean food. <laughs> Even when I was really young, when Korean food was not popular, my dad really loved Korean food. So when I was young, I would, we were eating kimchi. So now um, I'm really happy to eat kimchi every day. <laughs> yeah. All right. uh, in your opinion, is the program that you're in uh, good? Is it up to par? Are you satisfied with it? <laughs> um, I'm satisfied. I think, of course, we have our frustrations. We have our we have our own, you know, frustrations and our own joys in the program. I'm not saying my, I'm not saying it's. Uh, I'm so disappointed about it. It could be better. It was very different from what I was envisioning. Why? I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. <laughs> Um, in Philippines, if you go for a master's uh, program, it means you're very, very dedicated in that field. You want to study more, you want to be an expert, and stuff like that. But then, I don't know if it's a general uh, like concept. Correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Um, I've been talking to some of uh, older Koreans, and they say, oh, you're studying master's, so you don't have a job. <laughs> You don't have a job, it's like you're studying for, you know, studying masters so that you can get a job. Uh, oh, oh, that's something new to me. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, maybe you could also explain that to me. <laughs> is, is it true? Like, it's, it, it would, um, how do you say that? It would bump up your specs. They call it specs, okay? So if you don't have a job, you study more, you do more, do more volunteer work, more programs, then you'll be better. Um, yeah, that's uh, so that, that's a very interesting thing for me. Um, I think Korea taught me a lot of new things. Um, but I, I believe whatever program you're in, it's also a personal. How do you say that? A personal. How do you say that? Decision to study. If you think the program is lacking, you should compensate for it. Find find ways to learn more. If you keep on complaining, oh my my program sucks, this is not what I signed up for, and you waste all your energies complaining, that's your loss. But you know what? What is good in Korea? There are so many opportunities for international students and Korean students to join like G20 conferences and 
helping out in, in conference like the nuclear summit or whatever stuff. I mean, expo and, and, and stuff like that. In the Philippines, you know, we don't have these things. If you want to join a high-level conference, you know, you'd be paying a lot. You don't have any volunteer works for this. You know, um, another thing that I really appreciate in Korea, that I, I'll be sharing to Koreans as well, coming from a, a developing country, of course, Korea now has a lot of resources, but for us, we don't have much resources. You know, doing research for us is very, very hard. Simply getting a journal article from a database is really, really hard for us. You know, I'm from a, I'm, I'm from a national university back in the Philippines. Supposedly, national universities we have really good facilities, right? Because that's the top university. So you know what, when we're researching, we have to call other university friends from other school who are private, which are private universities because they have more money. Um, what's your password for this database? Because we need journals. We, we do that. But in Korea, IT, Wi-Fi, everything is so good. Just sit down there, click, oh, it comes out. <laughs> right? It's something that maybe we take for granted, the, the easy access of material. I'll tell you another story. I'm sorry if I talk a lot. Is it OK? <laughs> I tell a lot of stories. <laughs> for instance, in the laboratories, I have a lot of uh, on me and Hong Tang working in the laboratory. Um, the iPads and the pen conditions and stuff like that. You know, back home, it's 1970s. They they use it, they wash it, they, they, they recycle it. But in Korea, it's just one one usage throw, one usage throw, which is really good because you know, um, if you want good uh, researches, you have to you know. Uh, how do you say that? Protect the. How do you say that? The, how do you say that? How can I explain it? Contamination. Yeah, the contamination thing, yeah. right? So you, you won't use it again. But for us, you know, we don't have any choice. You have to wash it and put it back. <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, uh, yeah, and even if they don't use it, but if the materials have been stuck there for some time, they, they will be throwing it. And all these things. And in the laboratory, if you need something, you just request it, and tomorrow it's gonna be there. Great. In Philippines, you need to make, maybe wait for one month or two months. <laughs> and then, or think of other ways how to get it. That's, that's, that's how it is. That's why you know we're very, as, as international students, we're very, very thankful for what Korea has been doing. Like, our ANMI, because I'm not in the laboratory, so I don't experience it, but I visit laboratories sometimes. They were so happy that they could work on DNA and stuff like that, which, which you only read back home, all theories. But here, you can actually do it. And that makes them very driven, very serious in their work. So, yeah, that's, so we're really thankful for Korea for giving us these opportunities to experience a different kind of alternative reality so that we can learn more. We have two more questions. Okay. One more is, one of them is, uh, when is your program finished and what will you do after? Mm. Actually, I'm graduating. <laughs> Yay! I'm <laughs> graduating this August. Um, and what I'll be doing? <laughs> um, I will be the president of the Filipino Students Organization. Uh, starting this year. Uh, I'll be working a lot on that. And I have a lot of, our organization has a lot of plans to work with other student organizations and hopefully with Korean, Korean organizations as well, Korean students. Um, and then uh, I'm in the process of applying for a PhD program. Um, so I'm crossing my fingers. Honestly, uh, I, I should be writing my study plan today. <laughs> but. Uh, I really want to grab this opportunity to share what I've learned. I'm not an expert on this. I'm not saying I'm an, I'm an expert. I, I might be saying, you know, some lacking things here, but I just want to share what I I found out and have a dialogue with everyone. 
So please pray for me. Hopefully I get in the program. <laughs> and I really want to stay longer in Korea. I think Korea is very promising. There's so much things happening, so many things happening here. Um, I think for the next 10 years, it's a very experimental uh, time for Korea about multiculturalism, about technology. There's so much space for experimentation, which is really good because you can think of new ways on dealing with things. Right. Okay. Last question is, what advice would you give to a student who is considering a program like yours? Mm -hmm. um, one very important thing is pre-departure orientation. But before you come to Korea, you, you should have at least an idea what you're getting in. For instance, um, for Filipino students, in terms of scholarship, a lot of our students are under scholarship. Filipino, scholar, uh, Filipino students are under scholarship. For instance, the university only gives them ishik mana. If you calculate it in Philippine money, that's a lot of money, just for studying. So you think, oh, that's really good, you know? I just study it, I get money. <laughs> but when you come to Korea, you'll realize, oh my god, 200,000 won won't help you survive in a month, right? But if you, you don't know these things, you know, you're caught off guard. You're, you're already here, you cannot pack, pack your bags and go home. Well, you can do that, but of course you won't want to. Um, but if you already know, you know, the standards of living, you know, and, and these stuff, and about um, the programs, academic culture in Korea is different from academic culture in the Philippines in terms of hierarchy, you know, the professor, like in the Philippines, you can rub our elbows, you know, professors and stuff, or can debate a lot, you know, with the professor. But um, in Korea, of course, there are progressive uh, teaching method as well. But generally, because of the hierarchy, it's not that easy. Right? But you have you have to be tactful in dealing with these things. We have students who are who fought with their professors and end up, you know, being uh, having a hard time. Not because the professor is bad, but because you know there was a clash of culture because they, he didn't know. He didn't know that you know that this should be the way and stuff like that. So pre-departure orientation, and I believe organizations, student organizations, could help a lot of this. For instance, Filipino student organization, Indian student organization, and, and stuff like that. You can simply have forums, you know, and consultation. If you have your sombe in that kind of particular university, then you can ask specific questions. Not just, you know, it's not just about what you read on the website, but it's also about the he, the silent, how do you say that, silent culture, <laughs> the silent issues. You have to know these things as well. It's not just what you read. So you have to be quite, how do you say that, creative in finding out, you know, what kind of life you'll be having outside the country. Um, and at the same time, uh, another one. For instance, NIIED, um, now they have, like, Handbooks for foreigners and stuff like that. If if they could they could see it, they could read it beforehand, or they could find information uh, and read it before coming here, then it would be better. And then if they they're already here, they should link up with other students because no one is an island. If you if you try to handle everything on your own, it will be hard. Okay, thank you. Well, that's the end of the question and answer portion of the talk. If you didn't get a chance to ask the speaker a question, you can come up after and ask her directly. And thank you. That's it.